know about you, but we've enjoyed this time. Go for it. First glance. Welcome to GC First. I'm Josh. Here's your first glance. If you're new to GC First, what a great day to be our guest. We hope you enjoy today's special service. We ask that you please take a moment to fill out the information portion of our given envelopes and place it in the offering boxes. We are so grateful for your faithfulness and generosity to the ministry of GC First. Your giving enables us to serve one another in the families of Granite City and around the world. You can give your tithes and offerings by going to here to place them in the floor. For any questions, please see Linda May. Being a part of a family means everyone does their part, and GC First is no different. Find out how you can do your part by talking to one of the pastors today. For more info and to stay connected, like our page on Facebook or text GC First to 84576. Thank you for joining us as we gather to love God and love people. Amen. Sorry for that. I almost jumped the gun and our sound booth went a little crazy. Sorry. They panicked. That's my fault. We've been doing this song for the last couple months off and on, but we've done it a lot here recently as we've been building up to missions. And I've been speaking to several people of all our generations that are represented here at the church. And this song seems to have been a very impactful song and it seems to be a great fit for what we discuss when we talk about missions and that it takes all of us doing our part to be a part. So we're gonna just transition into this time and we're gonna sing Available. And I'd like you to worship that this morning before we hear from our last speaker for our missions convention week. And just make sure that you acknowledge the fact that you're a child of God, so you have to be available. So make yourself available to listen to him. If you wanna stand, you can stand. It's whatever you'd like to do. As the road may see, I'll follow where your spirit leads. Broken as my life may be, oh, I will give you every
Throughout this week, our prayer has been that we would be sensitive to your voice, Lord, and that if there are anyone who has been a part of our gatherings this week, who has been talking to you about a call, Lord, that this week would bring confirmation to their hearts, to strengthen their ability to say yes. But whether we're called to go or we're called to serve right here, or we're called to be senders, the truth is that we all have a call. Lord, I pray that we would all be available to your voice and to your leading. Father, open our hearts and our minds and our ears and our eyes this morning to receive what you have for us in the word. Father, help us to listen attentively to the message that's gonna be shared with us so that we can partner with your work right here. Lord, we just pray that you would have your anointing on Deneen and that you would use her to challenge us this morning. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to tell you, we um, had the missions, uh, the missionaries lined up and there was a, a scheduling issue. There were some things that happened with the missionary that was supposed to be here this morning, and um, they're gonna come in a few months, but I reached out to uh, 
to Don with Teen Challenge, and I just said, I don't know what your schedule's like. I mean, it was like just a couple of weeks ago, and I said, You're, there's probably no way you can do this, <laughs> but is it possible? And Don and Deneen graciously split up this morning so that she could come here and share with us um, what God's doing through Adult and Teen Challenge in Illinois, specifically at the Audrey Ephraim Women's Center. And um, I'm really excited to hear about this. I hope you are too. So Deneen, would you come and share with us this morning? Thank you for being flexible and willing, right? <laughs> Available. <laughs> Available. Good morning. Um, being available is the key. And um, when you're available and God puts you in a situation that you never thought you would be in, um, wow, what a transformation it takes in your life. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, the Adult and Teen Challenge is a 13-month faith-based recovery program. And right now, the Women's Center is in Carlinville, Illinois. We've been open for almost three years. And although COVID has been around for the past 18 months, we have still had over 27 women come through our doors. Not all of them have stayed, but they've all heard about the changing power of Jesus Christ. And in the latest statistics right now in America, 46% of every family is affected by addiction. And if you don't think that family is yours, you need to take a different look. Because even mine and my husband's both, both of our families have suffered, have, have got people in addiction. My husband lost his only cousin on his dad's side to alcoholism at the age of 40. And she started drinking when she was eight. Um, we've had women call for our program as young as nine that we don't take because we only take 18 and older. But the oldest one was 83. And she was addicted to opioids from a surgery. So don't think it's not your family. We had a call from a, um, a family. The mom, 65 years old, had surgery, addicted to opioids, stealing from her children, homeless and living under a bridge. They didn't know where she was at, but when they found her, they wanted to bring her to us. I mean, we still haven't heard from them. I don't know if they've ever found her. But it's, it, it can affect anybody's family. And today I have Rachel with me, and Rachel is related to Travis, and this is Rachel's dad. Um, and I'm going to get right to her testimony this morning because she has a sister who lives in Poland and is visiting the United States for 10 days. So Rachel's on a pass, and her dad brought her here this morning. And so that they can go back and spend time with their family, I'm going to let Rachel come and tell you her story right away so they can get on the road. Good morning. My name is Rachel. Until I was 15, my life was good. Our home was stable. My parents were married, and they still are. I have two sisters, and life overall was pretty good. Probably the worst thing that happened to me in my youth was I began hanging out with the wrong crowd. I didn't even know why, but I began smoking marijuana when I was just fi about 15. I guess like most teenagers, I was just trying to fit in with my friends. As time went on, I continued to experiment with different things. Within a couple of years, everything began to spiral completely out of control. At the time, I knew my entire family was hurting. I also knew it was because of me. I just didn't care. After 10 years, I got so bad, eventually I wanted to die. The best part of my story begins with a simple phone call. I didn't even know about Adult and Teen Challenge, yet I was about to become a student there. There came a moment when I clearly saw for the very first time how destructive my lifestyle had become. One honest look in the mirror revealed things I could no longer ignore. In that mirror, I saw rage, disappointment and fear so overwhelming that alcohol seemed to provide the only escape. It seemed to be a better choice at that time because it was legal and cheap, but alcohol didn't work either. I was face to face with the fact that uncontrollable anger and, de and dependence on alcohol was about to cut my life short. And that's when my mom called the Dalton Teen Challenge. I agreed to apply to the program, was accepted, and the dramatic change began. My anger began to fade, the desire for a transformed life began to grow, and I will never be the same. Isaiah 41, 9 through 10 says, I took you from the ends of the earth, 
from its furthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When we celebrated Easter this year, my family and I are celebrating another empty grave. Somewhere in our state, a grave remains empty, and that might have otherwise been bought for me. When I finally surrendered, God made me a promise. He assured me that my anger, my fear, and my addictions would be taken away. He reminded me that he would heal my family's relationships. And he began his work at that very moment. Luke 145 says, Blessed is she who believed that there, would be, that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Today, I find that strength in his promises. We believe in family restoration. And so today she is leaving because the sister that lives in Poland... Um, she hasn't been able to see since she started the program, and so they are starting restoration this weekend. And her picture, can you slow the next slide? Um, that was her when she walked in the door. And a couple weeks ago, her mom took a picture of her standing outside of our, our center and said, I have two pictures of Rachel on my phone, and one was from the day before she came to the center, and today I have a picture of her standing, and it was just what she looks like now, and she said, only God can do this transformation. And so we're just grateful. We're grateful. Thanks, Rachel. Have a good trip. So how can you become a part of what we are doing at Adult and Teen Challenge? If you'll show the next one. This is a picture, this slide is my husband's cell phone number. And if you want to know how to get on our newsletter, get our newsletter, which we Travis handed out to everybody a little bit ago. If you have a family member who needs a teen challenge, either um, male or female, if you text your first and last name to my husband's cell phone number, he will contact you by text later today or tomorrow and, and find out what it is you need. We have beds available, and we are waiting to um, fill them. The problem we have with women is that a lot of them have children, and they don't want to leave them behind, and we know how hard that is for them. Our goal in the future is to provide a home for women with children. So that's a future goal. Um, it costs a lot of money to do that, and missions is about money because we can't do missions without money. And unfortunately, um, a lot of us struggle with that. But our newsletter, if you want to keep informed on what we're doing, the newsletter is there, and so just text your name again to that number or leave it with me, you, you know, write me a note, and I'll take it back with me, and he'll put you on our newsletter so that you know what's going on. Um, trying to get through all these. And since this is Missions Convention, I want to talk about your quarter competition. <laughs> I may have to help the women a little bit if I have any left in my purse. I tend to be the grandma who puts all my change in a bucket, and then when the bucket gets full, I take it to the bank and I divide it amongst my grandkids. Um, my husband and I have been blessed. In May this year, next year, we will have four grandbabies under the age of three. And um, we thought forever that we weren't going to have any because my son was almost 30 and he hadn't even got married. And our daughter, who had gotten married right out of college, they, they couldn't have kids. And then, thank you very much, now we have three and one on the way. And they are, of course, the most precious ones in the world, and yours aren't any better than mine. Um, and I know that. But I want to go to the, the next slide. This is because of BGMC. And that may not look like a lot to you, but that is a 24-placed um, eating set, new pans, new cutting boards, BGMC, a grant towards our center paid for that. The next slide, we also purchased this is what came in, the in our UPS trucks, FedEx trucks, and, and big semis. Um, and I'll talk about what's in those boxes in a minute. Um, next one. 
We were able to, on the left is a different picture of all those boxes, but on the right, we purchased end tables, new end tables, new lamps, a new fan, and a new alarm clock for every bed for every woman that walks in our doors. Next slide. This was our old classroom. We just had some six foot tables like what we use in all of our churches. And the next slide is all new study carols. Each student will have their own. We're gonna put cork strips on them so they can hang their pictures on there. But when we go to our study in our class time, they will have their own individual space that they can call their own. Next one. On the left, um, you'll see a new weed eater and a new um, leaf blower. We have five acres. It's a lot of work. On the right, we use under the bed storage containers because we don't have dressers and each woman is allowed one, 30, two 36 inch storage containers under their bed to put their belongings in. They're not allowed to have a lot. Next one. This is on the left is a new freezer, a new walk-in freezer. It doesn't look like much, but it'll be a six by six walk-in freezer. It comes in in a pallet. Oh my goodness, the guy who pulled up in the truck said, um, do you have people? And it was me and my, my, my yes, um, staff person, Debbie, and we're like, yeah, we're it. He goes, oh no. But we managed to help him get that off the truck on his lift. And thank God it did not tip over and kill us because it was so scary. And on the right, there's a package of, it looks like it's all shrink wrapped. That is all new lighting for our sanctuary building. We, li we are in an old Baptist church and our lighting is horrid because they took little can lights, painted them black and then put floodlights way up inside of there. So sometimes the ambiance is great, but you can't read. So we have all new lights that will be assembled. Um, Doug is trying to find some people who will volunteer to come and help put those up so that when we light up the room, we light up the room. And I think there's one more. One more slide. This is trash. <laughs> Along with um, all that stuff comes a lot of trash. But I want you to know we are recycling those styrofoam things in the back. We're waiting for snow and we're gonna see how well they slide down the hill. <laughs> so I saw those, they're like five inches thick and I'm like, that might just work. <laughs> we have just enough of a hill in the front of our property and on the side of our property that it, you know, when you're old, you don't wanna go too far. <laughs> and um, so we're gonna, we've saved those, we put them up in the storage room and we're gonna see how well they sled. So thanks to BGMC money, it paid for all of that. And not only that, but we also got a speed the light van when we first started. So they gave us a grant for $25,000 and we were able to find a van and it's 12 passengers and the other, the other people have it today. So we have, um, we have appreciated the fact that you guys have contests that help provide stuff for the women who come in. And it, I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't all we need. We still have a lot more. Um, right now we're looking at a $50,000 septic system because we are on a hill and we have to have two. We have to one that the stuff goes into and then we have to have another that we have to pump it up the hill into the real one. It's so crazy, but that's what we have to have. So two septic systems, each are $25,000, $50,000 so that we can have more than 12 women in the building. Um, we are in need of siding on the front of our building. We figured that will be somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars because we have the, the, our building set empty for six years, and the birds came along and put little holes in there, and we've covered them over. But now the birds have gotten the wires out, and the word birds are getting in the walls. So that's a need that we have. Um, when we reach twelve, we're going to need another van, um, and so the list goes on. We need new carpet. The carpet in the building's 25 years old. And so, you know, we do the best we can with what we've been given because God gave us that building for $150,000 and it is appraised at a million. And so it, that all started on a conversation at a football game between Debbie Heinzman and the pastor's wife at the, at the Cross Church in, in Carlinville. And the Cross Church in Carlinville is a Baptist church and they have become as important to us as the Assemblies of God Church in Carlinville. And we're just so grateful for that community effort. Um, I'm going to, I'm gonna just speak a little bit today about 
a man in the Bible who had a lot of faith. He had so much faith, he's listed in the Hebrews chapter 11 chapter of men of great faith. And so let's look at Abraham. In, Abraham, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 17, it says, It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom all your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God would bring him back to life. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. And as we read this in the book of Hebrews, I want to go back to where the story actually happened in Genesis chapter 22. And if you, I'm not going to read all 19 verses because that's like four pages in my sermon. But if you look at that, let's just look at a minute at Isaac, Abraham and Isaac on this journey. But first, let's pray. Father God, today, I just want to just bring to the, to the people in this church a, just a glimpse of how good you are and how wonderful you are. Even though this sounds like a horrible situation with Abraham and Isaac, God, so many times this could be us. I just pray today that you will help us see that nothing is impossible with you, nothing at all. And we just thank you for the opportunity to be here, to share together. And we just pray that you'll just bless the people in this congregation, God. I pray blessings upon them. And we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse 1, we see that it says that Abraham was tested. God was testing Abraham. And this, la this past week, I was reading something that said, God tests us, Satan tempts us. And so this was just a test of Abraham, for Abraham. And when I looked up the word uh, test in the, in the dictionary, it says, the means by which the presence, quality, or genuineness of anything is determined. So God was getting ready to test Abraham's faith only Abraham had no study guide, no driver's license manual, and no test prep class for this test. When my daughter was going to school to be an occupational therapist, I paid $600 for test prep because they guaranteed that if she took this class, she would pass her boards on the first try. Okay, because the boards are $1,500. So yeah, I'll pay $600 to only pay that $1,500 once, twice, once. And you know what? She was amazed. They prepped her, and she passed on the first try. It was the best $600 of her college life I had ever spent. But God said, Abraham, and Abraham said, here am I. Abraham did not know what was coming, but he knew God's voice, and he knew God's character. So whatever it was that God asked him, he knew it was going to require obedience. And this is what God said, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, he called him by name, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on the mountain, which I will show you. Wow, I am not sure that that's what Abraham expected to hear that day. Abraham, in his mind, I'm sure it went like this, take my son, my only son? the one I love and sacrifice him? Abraham and Sarah had waited 25 years for this son. This was the son that was promised to them. And if you have a child, you know what? You can take my car, you can take my house, I'll live in the street. Don't take my kids. Don't take my kids. But God said, take your son, your only son. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born. He, was, he had waited 25 years. Ishmael had just been, gone, been banished a few years earlier, and now Isaac may be gone too. God, you know what you're doing? In our center, we call it the what-ifing. What if I did this? What if I did that? 
And I'm sure Abraham did that all night. And I don't think he told Sarah. Do you think you'd want to tell Sarah? No. But in the morning, it says that he got up and he loaded the firewood and he took the fire. But I want to stop and think about this for one second. What if, I'm going to what if, what if God was testing Abraham because he had let Isaac become so important to him that he was no longer putting God first? What if this was a test of Abraham's faith because Isaac was just so important to him? I know when I let something get him too, in, too important to me, God seems to be like, slip it right out from underneath me. What happens to us when we lose our phones? What happens when the signal on the TV goes out? What happens when we begin making more money and we don't think we need God as much? These things are so important sometimes that we lose sight of what really is important and that God actually gave us all those things. We don't have a way of, we don't have any way of knowing if my theory is true about God testing Abraham, but he's a man just like we are. And I'm sure it was just as much of a problem for him as it is for us. I mean, our kids, they're valuable to us. I enjoyed every minute that my kids lived at my house. And now that they're gone, I love them even more. <laughs> and now that I have grandchildren, man, I'm glad I never hurt them. But they're still very important to me and I'd still die a death for them. But Isaac belonged to God, and I think down deep Abraham knew that. So Abraham got up, and he got everything ready, and he took his servants, and he took Isaac, and they headed for the hills. And I'm sure the whole time, Abraham's mind, it was racing. Maybe God will provide. Maybe God will raise him from the dead. <laughs> Here's my, my, my favorite response would be mine. Maybe if I just keep on driving, this just will pretend like it never happened, and I'll just drive right into the ocean. But for three days, three days, 50 to 60 miles, Abraham walked, and I'm sure the whole time in his head he was arguing with God or what ifing it or whatever. But on the third day, it says, Abraham said to his servants, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then, when we, then we will come right back. Abraham was not the terminator. I'll be back. But he said, we will be back. And Abraham and Isaac went towards the mountain. Abraham had faith that the outcome was going to be okay. He did not know how, but he knew they would both return. Sometimes if we spend too much time trying to figure out the how God will take care of us, we are likely to talk ourselves in a circle. Yesterday, I was reading the My Utmost for His Highest devotional book, and it was talking about faith, and I was like, how, how convenient this was. So I added this in, because this one line stood out to me. Lord, you have said, you've said it, and it appears to be irrational, but I'm going to step out boldly and trust your words. Man, that hit me. God says it, we're like, what are you thinking? And then we're like, okay, I'm just going to do it. This happened to me on the first time um, that we made a faith promise. And I'm just going to tell you a few stories about faith promises because I know you guys are doing those. Um, my husband and I were pastoring a small church, and this was in the fall. And I don't know what happened at work, but somehow I missed a form and I lost our health insurance. Um... I was sitting in the Sunday night service. We were doing the big missions convention in Peoria where there were like 30 churches involved. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to the service and God says to me, how much was your insurance payment? It was like $65 a paycheck. And he's like, give that as your faith promise and I'll take care of you. 
I was like, was that you? <laughs> okay, I was like, okay, if that's what it's supposed to be, then, you know, I'm in my head, I'm like, okay, I need to hear that again. And, and a little farther along in the service, it was like, give me your $65, and I'll take care of you. So at the end of the service, my husband's like, so what are we doing? Because he, he had a number, and I had a number, and mine was a little higher than his, and I was like, oh, I like his better. But I said, we're going to give $65 a paycheck, or $65 a paycheck. So it's like $135 a month. And I was only making like $350 a paycheck. So, I mean, that's a big deal with two kids and stuff, life. And I, he's like, well, that's a weird number. And I said, God said to give him our insurance money and he'd take care of us. So we did. Every paycheck. $65 for one year. We never got sick. We never went to the doctor. We didn't need a prescription. We didn't need nothing. And God, God was faithful. So the next year it came up, faith promise. God's like, you're going to double it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't think so. And he goes, no, not really. He said, you're going to double it plus 20. I was like, okay, God, um, I know you took care of us last year, but I don't, now I'm paying my insurance, so I don't have that $65 anymore, and now you want me to double it and add 20? And he's like, trust me. And I'm like that double dog dare you kind of person. I'm like, okay, well, you did it for a year. Let's see what happens. On our way to the missions convention, turn in your money, meet all the missionaries, ending service that they used to have down in East Peoria, we hit a deer. There were seven that crossed the road. We hit number one, totaled our car. Guess how much our payment was? 65 plus 20. So God gave us our money. And not only that, but when he totaled the, the car, we got back more than we paid for it. So we were able to pay it off. We had money left over. And our neighbor was selling a van that was in good shape. So we bought it for cash and had no car payment. So when God says give, you have to trust him. Because it's just money. And to God, that's nothing. And that, I mean, and every year, every year, it seems like that's the kind of thing that happens. So when God tells me, like, a couple months, my, like, I never give my husband money when a missionary comes. He's not allowed to have money in his wallet because we sold a little trailer one day, and the next day we went to a church service. We were the speakers. We were the missionaries. And they were raising money for BGMC, and all that money for the trailer <laughs> went to BGMC. And I'm like, really? He goes, honey, it's for the kids. <laughs> But that's the heart that you have to have when God speaks to you. That's what needs to happen. So Abraham, he was trusting God for the how. He didn't know. And a few verses later, oh, and then I was looking at this verse too, and I was, um, one of the girls at the center was reading, and she goes, well, how do you think Isaac was? I was like, well, he's a little boy. And so we got to looking, and here's the, the rabbis Here's the funny story we found. The rabbis think that Isaac was 37 at this time, which contrasts with what we believe, but this is what they say. The rabbis also reason that the death for Sarah after this event was because she found out about Isaac being the attended sacrifice <laughs> and died of a heart attack. So you can Google it, it's there. Um, but most people really think that he was between 17 and 20 about the age that Ishmael was when he was, was banished. But he had to be strong enough to carry the wood up the mountain. That's how I kind of wondered how old he was, because a little boy probably wouldn't be able to carry enough wood up a mountain, at least not the little boys I know. No matter how old he was, this was not just a faith journey for Abraham. This was a faith journey for Isaac. Isaac asks, asks Abraham in verse 7, Dad, Dad, we have wood, we have fire, and we have um, wood and fire, and we have no offering. Where's, what, in Abraham's response, God will provide. God will provide. 
And I'm sure Abraham at this point, can we walk slower, take more time? But when they arrived, Abraham built the altar and he laid his son on it. Can you imagine laying your 17, 18, 20 year old son on an altar bound? And it boggles my mind, but here's Abraham and he takes the knife. Where's your mind going? What would you do? I called my son because he's going to school for Masters of Divinity, and I'm like, but he also is a sports nut. And I said, what would a good sports term be for this moment? He's like, full count, bottom of the ninth, World Series, you're up to bat. This is third and down. I don't understand all these terms because I'm not a sports person. Third and down, you've got to get a touchdown, and you're on the two-yard line. But I said to him, I said, but I remember a game where he was in eighth grade and they were playing for the state tournament. It was the first game in the, in the series of the tournament. And he um, got walked to um, first base. And Chip is not a fast runner, so get that in your mind. And the next kid came up to bat and Chip starts running to second base. And everybody goes, <laughs> and nobody breathed. And he gets to second base and his coach says, what are you doing? He goes, you gave me the sign to steal. He's like, no, I just scratched my leg. <laughs> <laughs> so the coach was like, well, since you're here, we might as well just go for it. So the next person got up and walk. Next person get up, walk. Next person gets up, walk. So now the bases are loaded. And the last kid to get up can't hit. And the coach tells him, just bunt. And he looked at Chip and he said, if you've ever ran fast in your life, this is it. Well, Chip was the only one who scored in that game because when he started running, it was like chariots of fire because <sighs> everybody was not breathing and everything was in slow motion. But he slid across home plate and he scored the only run and they were able to go on, which they eventually then ended up winning the whole state tournament for Class 1A. But I said to him that I felt like Abraham had to be that, that dad that wasn't, was like not breathing for that second as they watched his kid do something. And for me, I remember that night of that game because I was like, I'm going to die before he gets there. This had to be gut-wrenching. But imagine for Isaac, it had to be the same thing. And then a voice calls out, Abraham, Abraham. And I bet you anything, when God said Abraham, or the voice of the angel, Abraham, Abraham, <gasps> yes, thank goodness. Do not lay a hand on that boy. Do not hurt him in any way. And I think this is the most powerful part of this whole, whole story that was written. For now I know that you truly fear God, that you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. See, this was the moment God had been waiting for. This was what God had been wanting from Abraham all along. This is what God wants from us. He wants us to not hold back anything from our lives. At that moment, if I had been Abraham, I would have dropped to my knees and cried like a baby because God provided in the thicket a ram. And Abraham then called the place Yahweh Yirah, because the Lord provides. Have you ever been in that situation in your life where, you know, we've, we had a time when, when Don became unemployed and there was a flood in Chicago and, and um, what are the checks you get when you're unemployed? Unemployment, unemployment checks. How, was, how hard is that? Well, he was also unemployed at one time because of an accident with workman's comp. That was a totally different thing. But they weren't mailing the checks because there had been a flood in Chicago and our rent was due and I, Chip was three years old and I said, Chip, you need to pray. Because at that moment, I didn't have faith. I was like, you know, they're never going to get that check. You know, we're never going to pay our rent. And Chip prayed and the next day, they caught up and all those checks came in the mail. And I was like, see, see what you can do? But on that mountain that day, God provided he provided the sacrifice, God provided the sacrifice, and Abraham and his son were able to walk back down the mountain. 
When God becomes the center of our lives, we soon realize that we must go back. We, we must give back to him everything that he asks from us. For me, coming to Teen Challenge was that moment. I was comfortable where I was at. I had a job. We had a church. And it was comfortable. But God doesn't want us in our comfortable and then he, then, you know, the adult and teen challenge thing came up, and my husband was all in. Oh, yeah, we're going. I'm like, mm, no, I don't think so. You might go, but I think I'm waiting. And uh, like, I'm like, honey, what do we know? We've never been addicts. I don't know anything about addicts except for the students I'd had in high school. I was comfortable. My job, my life, my everything. I was six years away from retirement, and God said, Retirement, guess what? Not now. This has never been what I expected for my life. But if I have faith in God to do the what, does it really matter the how? I go back to what I read yesterday from my utmost from his highest. Lord, you've said it and it appears to be irrational, but I'm gonna step out boldly and trust your words. For me, it was selling two-thirds of everything I owned, selling my house, and moving into a small apartment in Carlinville, Illinois, which I think is the swamp of the earth. <sighs> I've never had so many allergy problems in my whole life as I do in Carlinville. I've never wanted to live there. I never had a desire to even go there. I did camp, that was enough. But somewhere in the back of my mind, or my husband's mind, Carlinville would be the great place to retire. No. But guess what? That's where we're at. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Some days I'd give it away, <laughs> but I wouldn't trade it. We've had women in our center. Oh, I wonder if God can even fix them. And then I watch it happen. We were just sitting and reminiscing about some things the other night and some of the stories that I could tell, tell you of women. Um, one lady in her mid-40s, her parents and sisters and brothers did an intervention, picked her up, took her son, who was 10 years old, dropped her in a detox, packed her bags, packed up her apartment, put it in storage, brought her to our center, she didn't even know she was coming. Six weeks later, she was out of there like a light. But in that six weeks, we got to talk to her about Jesus Christ. And the last we heard, she had not gone back to drugs. I don't know if she's living for Jesus, but I know she heard the word. We also had a lady who came to our program. She was the oldest one that we've ever had. She was 60 years old when she walked in the door. She was an alcoholic. She was tough. She knew everything. She knew AA. She knew the book, the AA book, which is the Bible. Did you know that? AA book is the Bible. We didn't know what we were talking about. She didn't have a clue, but she was there seven weeks, and she left. She called me 13 months later said, I want you to know that what you did for me in those seven weeks, I will never, ever forget. She said, I left, I relapsed. But in January, she left just after Thanksgiving. She said, in the middle of January, I went back to a rehab center, and this time I knew it was for real. She said, in a year's time, I have my job back. My kids are back in my life. I get to see my grandkids again. And it's all because you didn't give up on me. You didn't throw me out when I was a pain in the rear end. You still loved me. And she said, I thank you for what you're doing. And she said, in one of these days, I'm just gonna show up and bring food for you guys. I'm still waiting. <laughs> but what I know is that I wouldn't trade what God has let me do for a million things or dollars, except when I need stuff at the building. 
God, what you've said, it appears to be irrational, but I'm going to step out boldly and trust your words. So today I want to ask you, are you holding back anything from God? Are you giving back to God everything he's given to you? Your time, your money, your talents? What about your anxiety or your pride or your anger or your bitterness? God just wants complete surrender. Abraham is an example of that. On that day, he held nothing back. And that's what God wants from us. Not holding back anything. Let's pray. Father God, today I just, I just ask for your help and, and your spirit to, to d- dig deep into us and see if there's anything that we are holding back. And if we are, God, let us give it to you. Let us be willing to listen to that voice when we make our faith promise pledges. And when, when, it, when, when we disagree with the number we hear, God, just let us remember that you provide everything we have in the first place. And that there is nothing that you're asking us to do that you can't have a how to what the what is. You are the how. You are the how it gets done. And today I just thank you for the opportunity to be your servant, to be your master, your, your vocal piece for this congregation. God, I just pray that you will bless this church as they make their faith promise. Let it be bigger than it's ever been before so that more people can know about you because the time is coming short that you're going to be calling us home. And when we go home to to heaven, God, we want to take all of our friends and our enemies with us. God, I just thank you so much for being a good God. Amen. Thank you, Deneen. Two things. Those of us who are watching The Chosen, as Deneen was talking there at the end, the one thing that stood out to me was the encounter that Mary Magdalene had with Jesus. And when she was, scripture says that she was possessed by seven demons. And the show portrays Nicodemus trying to cast the demons out of her, and he couldn't. And he said, this is, this is something only God could do. And then he sees her whole days later. And he confronts her, and he said, how could this be? And, and he said, what, what prayer was it? And she said, it wasn't you. And he said, well, who was it? And she said, I don't know his name, and even if I did it, I wouldn't tell you. And then she said, all I know is I was one way before, and now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. When we support the ministries like Teen Adult and Teen Challenge, that's exactly what we're doing. We're allowing women to have the men and men to have the opportunity to have this encounter with a life-changing God so that they can walk away and say, I was one way before, and now I'm completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. And that's what every life who encounters one of our missionaries, that's the opportunity they get. What a privilege it is to be a part of the sending agents to make those opportunities happen. So as you're sitting here this morning, I know we we went just a few minutes longer than normal, but I think that's okay. Would you take just another minute and would you ask the Lord, what would you have me do, God? I know I could do this amount, but God, what do you want me to do? We gave the kids BGMC pledge cards. We've got uh, Speed the Light pledge cards for the students. And every other spot has a faith promise card. I said pledge. That's probably not the right word to use because we're not asking you to commit to giving necessarily a certain amount. Oh, that'd be great. We're asking you to say, Lord, with your help, what, what can you enable me to do? And you fill out the card and you turn in 
You turn in one side and you keep the small other side as a reminder. And what the missions committee does with this is we, we really don't pay attention to the name, to be honest with you. Am I right, Wanda? <laughs> we look at what you put down that you believe with God's help you can give. And can I just say, Deneen said it in a different way. If the number you're writing down doesn't make you like catch your breath, I don't believe it's a faith promise because that, that just tells me it's what you already know you can do. One of the places in scripture where we can test God is in finances. Test him. You can't outgive him. What can he enable you to do? That's the number you put down. So I'm going to pray one more time, and this will be a prayer of dismissal. And so as, you're, as you feel led to go, fill out your card, um, and you can leave them... Uh, I'll tell you what, just drop them in the offering boxes. Is that okay with you, Pastor Travis? Just drop them in the offering boxes. And um, this just gives the missions committee an idea of what we can do looking ahead for the year. This is how we know, this is what gives us the faith to step out and say we can add another missionary to who we support or we can bump up the missionaries we support, whichever, but we've heard from a lot of great missionaries this week. And so um, I'm really excited, but let me pray. I don't want to keep going. You know what to do. Lord, again, thank you for Don and Deneen and their faithful obedience to follow you in a season when they believed they were done, God. <laughs> and they heard your call and they said, yes. They've taken a huge step of faith, Lord, in, in serving an Illinois Adult and Teen Challenge. And God, as a church, I know we already support them. But Lord, I pray for an abundance of support to come in from places never expected or thought of, Lord. But that you would open the storehouses of heaven, Father, and pour over the Audrey Ephraim Women's Center what they need to serve women well and to increase the capacity of how many they serve, Lord provide everything that they need, every penny, every vehicle, the septic system, Lord. Bring people to be a part of the team. And Lord, for us as a congregation, speak to our hearts so clearly this morning as we pray and ask you, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do so that men, women, and children in Illinois, in the United States, and around the world can have an opportunity to say, I was one way before, but now I'm completely different. And give us the strength and boldness and faith like Abraham to write that number down and then to trust you for every penny that we need to give. I pray your blessings on each one this morning, Lord. I pray that you would go with them and that you would challenge their hearts and that you would provide opportunities individually for us to tell somebody this week about your goodness. We thank you again and we praise your name. And the church said, amen. Have a great week.